So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us at this um, Catalysis Hub webinar. It's my great pressure, uh, pleasure to introduce Elaine O'Reilly from University College Dublin, who's going to be talking about cascading towards new biocatalytic amine shuttling methodology. Thank you very much for joining us, Elaine. Great. Thank you very much, Josie, and thanks so much for the invitation to, to speak today and tell you a little bit about the work that's been um, going on in our lab for the past uh, few months and, and few years as well. Um, so I've titled the talk Cascading Towards New Biocatalytic Amine Shuttling Methodology. So I'll, I'll focus on, on that for the, the first half of the talk and then talk to you about some of the other um, biocatalytic cascade methodology that we've been um, trying to develop over the past, past few months. So this is um, some pictures of UCD, which I have down here. I've managed to capture UCD in the sunshine, which it isn't always in, as you can imagine. Um, but it's a, a really beautiful building that we're, we're very lucky to work in. It's the O'Brien Center for Science, and it, it's here. And our labs are located sort of on the other side of this building here. But if you ever have a chance to visit, it's a, a really beautiful state of the art building with great laboratory facilities and a lovely new shiny cafe as well in here, which, which certainly wasn't there when I was a student in UCD. Okay, let me see if I can change through these slides. Yeah. Okay, so just an overview of what our group are, are interested in, and I'm only going to focus on a small aspect of, of where our interests are. So we're interested in um, really developing methodology using enzymes. So looking at thinking, how, how can we make um, molecules that we're interested in, often complex targets with multiple stereocenters, how can we make those by incorporating either one key biocatalytic step or perhaps even a number of biocatalytic steps to develop a, a biocatalytic cascade? So of course, to do this, to develop biocatalytic methodology, you need the enzymes. We are interested in evolving enzymes and develop, developing them for our, our needs, but we're just as happy, if not happier, to steal enzymes that other research groups have, have developed and use them uh, to showcase the methodology that we're interested in. But we are looking at evolving and engineering some enzymes for, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, we've developed methodology, these two I guess are a bit linked. We've, we've put a little bit of effort as well over the years into developing methodology to allow us to screen. So if you're going to engineer biocatalysts to evolve their properties for whatever reason that might be, it could be thermostability, it could be enhancing the substrate scope, you need to have a way to screen and to pick out the catalyst that you're interested in. And so we did invest quite a bit of time and energy in developing screening um, methodology to allow us to, to select those catalysts. Um, we're not quite as active in that area at the moment, but we are using some of our, our methodology, our own screening technology um, to, to engineer enzymes at the moment as well. Okay, so I should have said, I guess um, we've, we start looking now more recently at really this idea of, of putting enzymes in, into sequence to, to think about cascades. So where you have maybe multiple enzymes acting in the same reaction vessel, in the same pot, and the product of one biocatalytic step then becomes the, the substrate for the next transformation. And there's lots of advantages to this. And I think this next slide sums up quite well a lot of the advantages of using biocatalytic cascades. So this is a, um, a paper that came out in Science a couple of years ago, or back at the end of 2019, um, a collaboration, one of a few collaborations between Merck and Codexis. So Merck were interested in accessing um, this um, antiviral agent as Latrovir. And there's a few things to point out in this cascade, I think, which really showcase the power and, and, and the utility of, of enzyme cascades. So we focus, first of all, on this, uh, the, the bit that's highlighted in this box. This is really the key step that, that uh, takes these three components and builds them into the, the target compound. Well, this really was inspired by a natural um, pathway by nature's um, bacterial nucleoside salvage pathway. And this is a pathway which takes valuable nucleosides and recycles them, essentially breaks them back into their components and reuses those valuable components. But one of the really nice things about many enzymatic processes is that reactions can be run in either direction, so they're reversible. And this particular piece of work really took advantage of, of this um, reversibility of many of these biocatalytic processes. And instead of recycling these um, components, in fact, using the uh, chemistry in, in the synthetic direction, if you like, to build up this valuable nucleoside analog. So it required lots of engineering. Some of these enzymes were, were quite heavily engineered to, to accept um, non-natural substrates in order to build up as Latrovir. So for example, um, it required a, um, 
a stereo, a, a fully um, saturated uh, stereo center at this position, which wasn't isn't there in the natural nucleoside, and a fluorine subst substituent, which also isn't there um, in the natural nucleoside. So these enzymes were engineered for that uh, to enhance their substrate scope. I think selectivity, um, and also to withstand high concentrations of substrates. I think one of the things as well that this cascade really highlights nicely is that it's not only the, the power of enzymes to actually do the synthesis, so to, to the key carbon-carbon bond forming chemistry, et cetera. Um, it's not just that that these enzymes are useful for, but you can see in, in orange, we, I've highlighted some of the other functions that these enzymes um, are responsible for, things like cofactor regeneration, um, maintaining the metal oxidation state, byproduct removal to drive the reaction equilibrium and things like that. So it's not just about the synthetic capabilities of enzymes, but they have many other functions. And I think one of the other things I really like about this cascade, and it's true of many others as well, is it highlights that, okay, it's taking inspiration from a natural um, pathway, but you don't need to take the enzymes directly from a particular source. Even if the pathway that you're interested in can be is found in a fungus or in a plant, you're not limited to taking enzymes from that source. Um, and in fact, the postdoc who we were, we were um, fortunate to, to be asked to write a sort of a news and views on this article. And it was, it was really nice to write because it allowed you to really think about what was going on. And the postdoc who I was writing this with wanted to um, call it, wanted to incorporate the word Frankenstein somewhere into the title of this. And I, I didn't, we didn't do it of course, but I understand where he was coming from because if you look at the, the sources where these enzymes are coming from, fungal, bacterial, mammalian, plant, bacterial, it's really a, a, you know, a huge diversity of sources that you're able to combine into one cascade and you're not limited to just picking enzymes from a single pathway. So I'm gonna take you back um, briefly to some work we did quite a few years ago now, but it really just to introduce you to where uh, we are today and what we're looking at now and where this has come from. So back in 2016, um, probably quite close to really the beginning of my independent career, we were working on, we were, we were interested with a, a colleagues in uh, Manchester Metropolitan University, interested in accessing uh, these disubstituted um, pyrrolidines using uh, transaminases, so using a biocatalytic approach. And the idea centered on starting from um, these ketoenone starting materials. So if you look down at this scheme, we can start from the ketoenones, use a transaminase, of course, with the PLP cofactor that's essential for activity and a suitable amine donor, selectively install the amine on the ketone, which then undergoes a spontaneous azomycle reaction to give back a mixture of diastereomers for this disubstituted uh, pyrrolidine, or sorry, piperidine, which we can then epimerize under yeah, standard conditions. So this methodology really worked really well and if you look again at the, um, the start, well, look down here at the, the starting materials that we were using, we're, we use quite a, a range of these. I haven't shown that we had lots of different R groups at this position, but we were quite limited um, on the ketone uh, portion of the molecule to a methyl group. And that's because the, the way the active site pocket of a transaminase is, um, it, they need to have, um, a, they can aminate a ketone where at least one side, one of the R groups is something small like a methyl group. So here we could have anything we wanted. And this really gave us guaranteed selectivity because whilst there's precedent in the literature for transaminases to also aminate on enones, the fact that we had a big R group here meant that we weren't going to get that. We would get selective installation of the amine on the desired ketone and then our spontaneous azomycle reaction. But we wanted to finish off our paper with some sort of a natural product synthesis, something to showcase the, the power of our methodology. And we, we looked at pinadenone. And here we had um, a, a bit of a different situation because now on the enone, we had a methyl group as well. So the question arose, would we get any selectivity issues? What we wanted to do, of course, was aminate on the ketone portion to generate the azomycle precursor, you know, spontaneous cyclization to give us back the desired product. But would we have a selectivity issue? So it's very possible, in fact, very likely uh, that the transaminase will Okay, aminate on the ketone, aminate on the, ket on the enone portion of the molecule, and potentially even give us the diamine. But when we ran this reaction with the um, dimethyl derivative, the starting material that gave us access to this pinadenone natural product, 
we didn't see any of these side products or these co-products. We just saw the mixture of diastereomers, which we could, of course, epimerize, and this chemistry worked beautifully well. So, of course, we, we then hypothesized that it's very likely that these different intermediates are being formed during the reaction, but that they're being shuttled back and forth until you get your azomycal precursor. And then you have this sort of thermodynamic sink, which just pulls the, um, the reaction over to give you only the, the sort of the productive product, which is the azomycal. It's the, the only productive uh, reaction is this azomycal um, reaction. And everything else that's formed, so for example, if it forms on the enone, or if you get the diamine, it's fine, but it's, it's all in equilibrium. So it's cycled back and forth until only this product remains. And we showed this, um, we wanted to demonstrate that that was at least possible. We're not a mechanistic group. So we did this in the, in the simplest way we could. And that was to actually just generate one of the potential um, products from this reaction. If the transaminase had aminated on the enone, we synthesize this molecule. Normally the transaminase, and you'll see this in a moment, for those of you who aren't familiar, you would have a, a uh, amine donor, so two substrates, the amine donor and the carbonyl acceptor. But here, if you look at this molecule, we had those both in the same molecule. So rather than an external uh, separate amine donor and carbonyl acceptor, we now have the opportunity to transfer this amine functionality intramolecularly. So in this particular experiment, we, we synthesized this um, amino ketone, added it into our reaction with just PLP and the transaminase, no external amine acceptor, and what we found is that we got full conversion to the mixture of, of uh, penadinone and its, its um, isomer. And we describe this as a sort of an amine walking. So you're, you're kind of walking the amine across the molecule until you get to the azomycal precursor, which of course spontaneously cyclizes. Um, and it's sort of a, a dynamic covalent biocatalysis. And, and certainly the first example when we published this of, of this type of reaction happening with a transaminase. So um, transaminases and, and PLP are, are in fact really ideal shuttle catalysts. So again, if you look at what's, what's happening in a transaminase reaction and the one that I've just shown you where you have this intramolecular shuttling, you have an amine donor um, and the amine acceptor, the carbonyl in the same molecule. And all that's happening is PLP picks off the amine functionality it uh, synthesizes, it, it converts that to PM, uh, PMP, which then becomes the amine donor, and PMP then shuttles that functionality onto the acceptor. In this case, it happens to be within the same molecule. But this kind of shuttling is happening in transaminases all the time. That's what PLP does as a cofactor. That's what NADH, in fact, does as a cofactor um, as well. And we'll see that in a little while. In, in this case, it was just nice because it happened that the acceptor site and the donor were in the same molecule. Uh, we didn't really push this methodology too much further, although I, I did want to at the time. And the reason is we were a little limited because of the nature of the transaminase active site where we were limited to really a methyl group, something small. Um, and, and that sort of limited the, the utility. We could have engineered these or at least got a library from somebody else um, who, who engineers transaminases more than we would. Um, and it's still a possibility, but we, we sort of moved on. And I started to think about what I could do with this type of shuttle methodology. Um, and in whilst I was thinking about, it, I had a, a couple of maternity leave periods, so I had lots of thinking time in a sense. Um, but it took a while to really think about what we might do with this and discussed with many colleagues as well. And one of my colleagues, uh, Anthony Green from the University of Manchester said, you know, it's a, some parallels with what you're thinking about with uh, shuttle catalysis, which is um, something that's been developed by Bill Morandi um, at ETH in Zurich. And for those of you who are not familiar with shuttle catalysis, it's a really nice concept and there's huge um, amounts of uh, publications in this area for those of you who are interested, I've given a few down here. And, but if you look in the forward reaction, um, this concept involves taking an acceptor substrate a sacrificial donor and essentially shuttling this group from the donor to the acceptor substrate to generate the product and the byproduct. And there's some type of driving, driving force to displace that reaction equilibrium. Now, this is really useful methodology if you want to shuttle really reactive functionality or something that's really toxic, um, for example. In the reverse direction, you can see it's essentially the reverse of above. You have a donor substrate, a sacrificial acceptor, 
And again, the group, uh, the shuttle group is shuttled from one molecule to the other. And there is again, some sort of driving force to displace that reaction equilibrium. And this type of methodology has been used to um, sort of valorize waste compounds am amongst others. So we started to think, you know, about the parallels and, and maybe what we could do with this type of shuttling idea with enzymes, because really, apart from a few examples, there wasn't um, much exploited in this area. But as I mentioned, coenzymes are really perfect shuttle catalysts, PLP being the one that we're focusing on here. Um, and again, for those of you not really familiar with the, the cycle of a transaminase cycle, I've just depicted it here quite simplistically, where you have an amine donor. So for a typical transaminase reaction, you have an external amine donor um, and a separate carbonyl acceptor substrate. The PLP really functions to pick off the amine functionality to generate PMP. And then it's PMP that essentially becomes the amine donor. Of course, this is bound in the active site of the enzyme. The PMP, sorry, in the first, in the first half reaction, of course, you generate a co-product. So once the, the PLP picks off the, the amine um, functionality from your substrate, you generate a co-product. Now, in lots of cases, this co-product is waste. And in fact, often to drive the reaction equilibrium, you've got to find some way to remove that co-product. And there's many elegant ways to do this. And in the second half reaction, your second substrate, which is your carbonyl acceptor, is converted to the chiral amine product, which is usually what we're, we're interested in doing, of course, by um, shuttling this amine functionality onto the substrate to generate your chiral amine product. Okay, so this concept, what, what is the concept? And I thought about this for far too long and you'll see that we've come up with so little for the length of time that I thought about it, but how could we think about, you know, um, extending or really making use of this concept of, um, shuttle biocatalysis and, and how could we maybe um, demonstrate its utility. So I've shown you this example where, um, which we, we published a few years ago, where we had a donor and acceptor site on the same molecule and we used a transaminase essentially to shuttle that group from one side of the molecule to the other, which then cyclized. And in that case, it was a, an azomycal reaction and that was um, what I we demonstrated with this little sort of mechanistic experiment. But can we extend this or develop this concept a little bit more to introduce a concept of amine borrowing via this shuttle biocatalysis mechanism? So what would this involve? Well, let's say we have a donor molecule and an acceptor molecule, and we use a transaminase with PLP to shuttle this group from the donor to the acceptor to essentially generate an acceptor and a donor. So we've just shuttled that group from one molecule to the other. And of course, this is reversible. Many of you are now saying this is exactly what a transaminase does. And that's exactly what a transaminase does. But what if we could do something a little more? And instead of just generating the products like you would do in a typical transaminase reaction, maybe you're accessing a particular chiral amine, you focus on generating reactive intermediates in situ. So you're using your enzyme, in fact, to generate reactive uh, intermediates, which undergo some sort of a downstream step to displace the reaction equilibrium. Uh, it could be a condensation reaction, it could be a cyclization or a polymerization, whatever that may be. And you generate your product. So the, the amine borrowing bit comes because um, for a, I guess for a typical transaminase reaction, you're using a sacrificial amine donor, which becomes a, a co-product. And in a lot of cases, that co-product is waste. In fact, it's uh, often derivatized in order to help displace the, the reaction equilibrium. But what if instead of a sacrificial amine donor, we used a donor that got transformed into the acceptor molecule, one of the reactive intermediates, which then condensed or polymerized or had some sort of a cyclization event to give you back your product where the amine has been reincor reincorporated into the final product. And we're uh, liking the, the concept of, of amine borrowing. So what do ideal amine borrowing conditions look like? Well, as I've made these up myself, they, they fit very well with what we think we might be able to do. So you, you can feel free to add to this. Um, but ideal amine borrowing conditions will be something in our minds will be something where you're using stoichiometric equivalent, so one-to-one -one equivalent of donor and acceptor, you're trying to limit your waste. 
you've, you've limited byproducts, maybe it's just water or something being produced, um, and that the chemistry is efficient. There's no point in having one to one equivalents and having hardly any byproducts if you're only getting 10% conversion. It's, it's not a very um, sustainable um, reaction. So those are our ideas of what would constitute ideal amine borrowing conditions. Okay, so what's been uh, done in the literature in terms of this sort of shuttle catalysis style concept or where have we taken inspiration from? Well, we can definitely draw some parallels with the idea of biocatalytic hydrogen borrowing. Um, and this is something that's um, been really heavily uh, researched over the past few years, probably really mostly since 2015, since the groups of Francesco Muti and uh, Nick Turner published some really nice work in science. It's a really simple concept, but it's very elegant. So if you look at this scheme here, um, it involves taking this particular reaction involves taking uh, an alcohol with an alcohol dehydrogenase, oxidizing that alcohol to the corresponding ketone. And of course, doing that um, using the coenzyme NAD+. So during the oxidation, that NAD plus is um, converted to NADH. But then there's another enzyme involved, which takes the ketone, it's an amine dehydrogenase in this case, takes the ketone, and generates the corresponding chiral amine. And that needs NADH, of course, which is cycled back to NAD+. So this whole hydrogen borrowing concept, if you, you follow that through, um, you, you've got a very closed or redox neutral closed loop. Um, and essentially the hydrogen is being borrowed and donated. It's, it's taken from the substrate in the first instance, but it ends up back in the product, in, in, the, final, um, in the final product after this redox neutral cycle. So really simple but elegant chemistry. And of course, this is what nature does all the time. It cycles NAD plus to NADH and, and back around again. And another example appeared as we were sort of banging our head against the wall as well, uh, which we've been doing for years on this type of concept. Um, it appeared in uh, chemistry communications um, a few years ago in 2018 by the group of Wolfgang Krutel. And this uses a, a methyl transferase, essentially the same methyl transferase, in fact, in order to demethylate and then to methylate a second substrate. And, and they describe this as a sort of a shuttle uh, catalytic process as well. But there's been very little done on, on, on reported on, on this sort of idea of biocatalytic shuttle catalysis. Okay, so I've told you nothing that we've done so far because there's very little, so I'm saving it for the next few slides. But how can we exemplify the concept of amine borrowing? Um, well, this is what we want to do. So we wanted to show that we could generate reactive intermediates in situ. And we are going to start with a transaminase, although there's um, many avenues which we're, we're looking at now pursuing. But transaminases, we know them well. We know how to use them, and we have lots of them. So it was a good starting point. Can we use the transaminase not just to generate a chiral amine, but to generate reactive intermediates? which undergoes some sort of a downstream equilibrium displacement event and also return that borrowed amine into the product and under these, what we would consider our ideal amine borrowing conditions. Well, the first thing we thought about doing was the manic reaction. Um, it fit really well with what we wanted to do. Um, and the reason we, we settled on this is we thought it would be easy. We were very wrong. And um, we had worked on this for quite a bit, a number of years ago, uh, methodology, which was, was we were working on to, to help us displace challenging transaminase reactions. And it involved using things like cadaverin and, and lots of other diamine donors, which we term smart amines. And the reason these help displace the equilibrium is because they cyclize and they generate rate these cyclic imines, six membered or the five membered equivalent as well has been reported. And this cyclization event helps you to drive the reaction equilibrium. They try and rise as well, and that, that helps even further. So we thought, right, if we can, uh, instead of starting with the diamine, if we can take these dicarbonyls, use a, an external amine donor, which of course gives you back a co-product, but the co-product is going to be useful in this reaction. Um, but using these dicarbonyls, there's many you could think of, you generate the, uh, the amino ketone, whatever that may be, which then cyclizes to give you back the imine. And we knew from the literature and, and just from our own experience that you could get a spontaneous manic reaction where you react the co-product uh, with your product from this transat from, from the carbonyl transformation and give you back the, the manic product. And this would fit very well with our amine borrowing methodology plan. 
And we just wouldn't let it go. Um, so I had a, a very, a really excellent student in the lab, Freya, who's, who's just gone and um, left us for, for better things. She's, she's finished up now and she was brilliant. Um, she really tried everything with this manic reaction with the help of, of James Ryan as well, a postdoc who was in our group at the time and um, who, who was also funded in fact with Catalysis Hub funding. Um, and we, we banged her head against a wall for a long time. And so the reason I think a lot of this chemistry didn't work, so the chemistry worked beautifully, that was clear. But as soon as you tried to do it enzymatically, starting from the dicarbonyls, we had all sorts of problems. The carbonyls looked like they were reacting with our enzyme and uh, all sorts of things were going on, but we could never get that chemistry to work. So we sort of parked it, not left it fully because I'm very stubborn, but we've, we've certainly parked it for the moment. And we thought, right, uh, we're looking for other types of chemistry that might help us demonstrate this amine borrowing concept. Um, and we, we looked at something that came out in the literature by, from the group of uh, Anthony Green and Nick Turner at the University of Manchester. Now they were looking at norepiral synthesis, biocatalytic norepiral synthesis. Um, and what they were focusing on was um, taking, so the, the, the reaction, they were, they were taking these um, dicarbonyls. So there's alpha dicarbonyl, um, and an external amine donor with a commercially available enzyme. And they were using that enzyme to generate one of the reactive norpyrrole intermediates. So this um, alpha amino ketone. And they were adding in the second uh, norpyrrole uh, substrate, if you like. They were adding in this um, beta keto ester. So they're generating this in situ using the transaminase, which is actually quite useful because it prevents some side reactions. Um, and they were then, uh, these were reacting together spontaneously to give you back the, the parables. And we started to think this could in fact be a, a useful reaction. Um, now they then, sorry, to, what, what they did was they asked themselves a, a very good question. And this is how we, we picked up on this, some, some mechanistic investigations the group were doing. They were curious to see whether the transaminase, this was all in the one pot. So this um, beta keto ester, was in the reaction vessel at the same time as the desired transaminase substrate, this dicarbonyl. And they asked themselves the question, was the transaminase actually being selective for this ketone? Or was it also aminating on this ketone, the, um, on the ketoester? It's a very good question. And it's very likely that in fact, that is what's happening. But in a similar thing to, I showed you a few slides back where we, we demonstrated that it doesn't matter if you, if you have multiple products um, in your reaction, once you have an equilibrium and once the productive route kind of pulls that equilibrium forward. So even if it does aminate at this carbonyl, does it matter? Probably not because it just cycles back until you get these two um, products, sorry, these two uh, reactants that give you back the, the desired peril. So we picked up on this uh, mechanistic investigation and thought it would be useful. So what this group had done is similar again to something we'd done previously is they, they'd synthesized the likely um, intermediate. So imagine the transaminase had in fact aminated on this ketone, they synthesized that particular potential product. And instead of now using an external amine donor, so they didn't do this anymore, they had the amine donor here. So no external amine donor, and um, they had 10 equivalents of this. They weren't worried at all about amine borrowing conditions at all. They were just trying to demonstrate a sort of a, a potential mechanism. Um, and they generated the reactive intermediate, the reactive uh, intermediates in situ. And they isolated the, the peril in, in pretty decent conversion. So what this did for us is demonstrate that really this could be a good way to showcase our amine borrowing methodology. As I said, that's not what was going on here. And so they were using 10 equivalents of, of the starting amine, lots of transaminase and not very high concentrations because it wasn't their concern. Just trying to show that um, you have this dynamic process um, because of the reversible nature of this reaction. Okay, so we wanted to pick up on this particular piece of chemistry um, and, and see if we could use it to demonstrate our amine borrowing methodology. Available uh, to buy commercially was a racemic version of this uh, beta amino ester, uh, which was uh, our, the starting amine that you saw on the previous slide. So we had to use two equivalents of it because it was racemic and of course our enzyme would only accept one. It was an R selective enzyme, would only accept the R enantiomer. Uh, we did things like really drop the, the enzyme loading as well. Um, and we raised the concentration. Loads of these conditions worked, but these happened to have been our best conditions. And you can see in this transformation, you start off with this 
um, amine. You've got no external amine donor, if you will. And um, you start off with the racemic amine. It's converted to the beta ketoester. Um, and then in doing so, of course, you generate PMP, which takes your second substrate, your alpha dicarbonyl, aminates that to give your second reactive intermediate. And then these two compounds that are in blue are, react together in, um, in the norperyl synthesis to give you back this substituted peril. And that worked really well. 94% conversion, uh, 24 hours, the reaction's not that quick, but many of these biocalic reactions are not that quick. But the point is, we're starting to now look at this concept of generating reactive intermediates in situ, and we're loaning the amine, but we're getting it back in the final product. And the one that you should, the ester that you saw on the previous slide was only available commercially in its racemic form, but the methyl version of it, the last one was the ethyl ester, was available in its enantimerically pure form, at least I think it was, I don't know, I think we, we purchased it. Um, and so now we could really get down to our amine borrowing conditions, one equivalent of the R amine, exactly the same chemistry as you've seen, we're generating our reactive species in situ by this shuttling activity of the, the PLP and the transaminase, these then react together and you have this sort of amine borrowing and, and returned again in your, your final product. Again, um, good conversion. And we're able to isolate loads and loads of this material as well. So we're really now at our true made up, uh, admittedly, but our true amine borrowing conditions where we're using one-to-one -one equivalents of donor, we've got limited byproducts and we have a very efficient reaction. We're getting up to 94% conversion. Okay, and um, we wanted then to look for, you know, more chemistry that with transaminases that might be able to showcase this methodology. And so we looked at the pictet spengler reaction. And the group of Helen Hales in University College of London work a lot with pictet spenglerases and they also work with the um, uh, pictet spengler reaction just catalyzed by phosphate. So they're able to take these sort of dopamine uh, substrates with these sort of dope -al type aldehydes and, and generate the tetrahydroisoquinolines. And they've published quite a few papers on this. It's catalyzed by uh, phosphate. In, in fact, these we, we've done a few of these now with, with no phosphate, but it also works reasonably well in the absence of phosphate, just in different buffers. But it's certainly helped along by the actions of the phosphate buffer. And they can also do this not only with aldehydes, but couple these with various ketone partners. And again, we thought this could be a nice uh, way to showcase our amine barring methodology. So we take an amine acceptor and an amine donor and um, electron withdrawing group here on the acceptor is, is essential and use a transaminase and PLP to generate our pictet spengler reactive intermediates, which should then cyclize or condense together to give us back our tetrahydroisoquinoline. So again, this idea of generating the reactive species in situ using uh, transaminases. So the chemistry worked perfectly for this. We were able to, first thing you do is, is instead of looking at how the enzyme reaction is gonna work, just make sure the chemistry is gonna work. The chemistry works great. So we synthesized a few of these, but this is uh, one which we focused on where you have a dimethyl um, amine uh, substituent on the ring. And we reacted this with lots of different aldehydes, but this is one example um, under these conditions, conditions that will be tolerated by the enzyme. So 50 degrees is fine for a lot of the enzymes we work with a little bit of methanol in there about pH seven, quantitative conversion. As soon as you throw an enzyme in there and start instead of from the amine, but start from the ketone and ask the enzyme to shuttle this amine functionality to the ketone to generate these reactive species, all of a sudden our quantitative conversion drops, falls off a cliff and we're looking at about 10% conversion. And that was with a lot of optimization. So it was really disappointing. And you know we really haven't got to the bottom of exactly what's going on here because you know, the challenging thermodynamics might spring to mind, but in fact, if your pictet spengler reaction is working well, you shouldn't have any problem because it should be pulling that equilibrium over. So the idea that you know, you're trying to aminate a ketone and you know, it might not be favorable, that, that uh, subsequent reaction should displace that equilibrium, but it hasn't worked well. What worked a little bit better for us was when we changed to this uh, hydroxy uh, substituent on the ring. Uh, with this sort of vanilla type amine, um, that that was our best. We we generated the the reactive intermediates in situ again by this sort of shuttling mechanism, um, and the pictet spengler reaction worked better. But again, we're we're at twenty seven percent conversion with a huge amount of optimization. So it's certainly we can consider that true amine borrowing conditions. We're not at one, we're not quite at one to one equivalence in this, and we're not getting very good conversion. 
Okay, so uh, we probably need the transaminase chemistry itself to work a little better and we're working on it. And poor Rachel, who joined my group for a, a research master's last year and is still there for another few months, uh, was tasked with solving all the problems on this pictet spangler reaction and she's doing a great job. And we're starting now to look, we're giving ourselves a better chance. We're starting to look at, at aldehydes and maybe make our life a little bit easier. And um, so Rachel is continuing with that. Okay, so that was our work on the uh, this concept of amine borrowing. And if anybody has any ideas or, or other directions, we'd be delighted to hear of them. We have other ideas, which I'll, I'll mention later on. But I want to just for the next uh, last few minutes, focus on another project where we've been looking at valorizing sugars. Um, and this is funding that I was very grateful to get when I moved back to Ireland a couple of years ago. It's always a bit daunting thinking, will you ever be funded again if you move countries? Um, but thankfully, SFI gave us some funding to, to look at valorizing sugars. And I'll just show you a little bit of that chemistry in the last few minutes. OK, so um, we kind of stumbled across this chemistry here down the bottom a few years ago, quite a few years ago, and I think it must be back in 2014 or 15 even. Um, and we weren't looking for it at all. We, we stumbled across the fact that transaminases appeared to be able to take sugars, aldoses, and aminate them. Now, this is sort of maybe obvious now if you look at these sugars in their sort of linear form that there's an aldehyde there and it's a perfect substrate for, for transaminases but it wasn't we it's not something we'd even thought about and it seemed to have been not something that others had thought about because it had never been reported all that had been reported on sugars were the types of reactions that you see above here where you have these phosphorylated sugars and the amination takes place on the ring uh, like this, so quite different to what you're looking at down below, um, or sugars that don't exist in their cyclic form um, at equilibrium, things like l so really simple sugars. There had been some activity reported on them, but this was quite new and quite interesting. And actually, here's the panel of, of substrates that we looked at. Um, we didn't see any activity with ketoses, um, only with aldoses. We do have some uh, now, um, which, I, which I'll explain in a little bit. But this was the panel, and these are the sort of conversions that we were getting with pretty high concentrations. You know, it can really make quite a lot of the corresponding amino alcohols from these aldoses. And I suppose we were quite surprised at how well this worked. We'd spent a lot of our time developing these smart amine donors to help push through to pull the reaction equilibrium. That's what we focused on for the first few years of, of my independent career. And all of a sudden you have these sugars where really very small proportion exists in equilibrium, or exists at, at equilibrium. Um, and we don't need smart amine donors. They work really very well with just a tiny excess of the amine donor, and we're getting very high conversion to the amino alcohols. So why would we want to, you know, what could we do with this chemistry, I suppose, is, is what we thought. Um, and we could think of a few things, but something we were interested in targeting uh, was amino sugars. So I've shown you some of the real household name amino sugars up here. Um, and these are compounds which have a really diverse range of, of biological activity, everything from antibacterial to cancer treatment. And one of the reasons cited for their, their lack of development is that they're, they're very complex to synthesize. And they're certainly complex, it, it's quite difficult to access enough derivatives that you could overcome some of the, um, the problems, the, the, um, the adverse uh, biological effects associated with, with some of these molecules. And so I think the feeling is that if you can access diverse panels of them, some of those side effects might be avoidable by, by derivatives. So we thought maybe we could access uh, these molecules easily or easier uh, using biocatalysis. And the idea was to develop a cascade where you started off with fructose, for example, um, but any sugar potentially used a transaminase to install the amine selectively and then had a biocatalytic oxidation event to give you back the sugar imine. And at this point, depending on the stereochemistry where this imine was, lots of things, you might just think about a chemical reduction to give you back the amino sugar. And in some cases that would be selective anyway because of the stereochemistry on the ring. Or you might think about using a biocatalytic reduction, which is probably more challenging. Okay, so um, the SFI project that we're working on, so I have two PhD students, Catherine and Adam, um, and Ollie, a postdoc on the project. Ollie has just left, so I'll, I'll tell you if, you if you want to be the next Ollie, we're looking for a postdoc at the moment, a molecular biologist. So these guys were tasked now with developing this cascade. So Adam is really focusing on the first part of this cascade, which is trying to find transaminases. And our goal is that you can take any sugar at the end of this, 
and use a transaminase to convert it to the corresponding amino alcohol. Now we're restricted at the moment to aldoses. Um, Helen Hales uh, in, in UCL reported one transaminase which worked on fructose. The activity is not great, but it's, it's good enough. It's certainly a good enough starting point. So we're having a look at whether we can evolve that or other transaminases. Um, for activity towards ketoses, because of course we want to be installing a chiralamine rather than uh, using aldoses. So Adam's is tasked with this part, and then um, Catherine is, is really focusing on this biocatalytic oxidation. This part here, we were, we've done almost nothing on, and we're likely to, to be much, much more difficult to achieve that sort of biocatalytic reduction. So I'll tell you briefly about a little bit of the work that we've done um, on the biocatalytic oxidation um, that Catherine is now following on from, but, but Justina, who's recently left our group, was working on for her PhD. So you want to be looking at something like an alcohol dehydrogenase or a galactose oxidase to do this type of oxidation. Um, and Catherine is looking at a range of these at the moment. Um, but Justina, who's, who's recently left to work in a, a, um, a company in London, she's, she's finished up now, was really interested in looking at whole cell catalysts and she fixed herself on G oxidants. So this is a real workhorse um, industrial organism and it it's, does lots of things like it can convert desorbital on an industrial scale to L-sorbose or glycerol to dihydroxyacetone. Um, the problem with this organism, although it's great, it seems to be a really good organism for, uh, for catalyzing these types of oxidations, the, the enzymes are often membrane bound, so they're really tricky to work with if you want to isolate them, and many in fact haven't been isolated or characterized at all. But the advantages of whole cells are you've got your supply of biomolecules and cofactors, um, you, know, you don't have to supply NAD, for example, to the cells. And you don't have to purify. So if you don't need to purify the enzyme and the organism works well, well, maybe that's a good thing. But there's reactions, uh, side reactions are possible. You could think about lots of cell permeability issues where your substrate can't get in or the product can't get out. And of course, you've got all sorts of other things in the cells. So you might have challenging purifications. And we've seen quite a few of these things as we've worked with whole, cell, whole cells over the years. Um, but G oxidants was worth a go, um, and it seemed to have been a, a good bet for these types of substrates. But when we made, we focused on the amino alcohols that we could access using our transaminases, we thought that was a sensible place to start. When we tried these with the G oxidants, we didn't see any oxidation products, um, and we needed to protect them. So as soon as we stuck a CBZ group, and there was a few other groups, a formal group, I think worked pretty well. As soon as we stuck the CBZ group on, well, we got quantitative conversion. So this organism did a really good job. And it probably wasn't a big surprise. There was hints of that in the literature and galactose oxidase seems to also need amino alcohols like that to be protected. But you can imagine that this protecting group step is, is ruining our idea of a nice cascade because we, you know, we think about enzyme cascades as being so useful because you don't need any protecting group manipulations. But of course, we're having to stop and, and protect in order to oxidize. So it's, it's not ideal. And I've tasked Catherine, a really good student in my group, with solving that issue and, and trying to get us around this, um, this protecting group manipulation step so we can really develop a cascade. But despite the problems we've had, I'm not going to talk about this because that's an even bigger problem, trying to get an amine reductase potentially to do this because of the nature of the active sites likely to be very difficult. Um, but we have, we've submitted this manuscript, it's been in for a few weeks, so we're waiting on either acceptance or rejection soon. Um, but we're, we, we have at least got a, a, a sequence where we can take something like a few examples that we have, but diarabinose, for example, install the amine. Okay, we've got to protect, which, which annoys us massively, and then use the G oxidants to selectively oxidize, and we can then chemically reduce. Um, in lots of cases, we get selectivity, we can get household names, amino sugars isolated and pretty good conversions and, and very good isolated yields as well. Okay, and in the final couple of slides, I just wanna show you where we would like to take this work. Um, and we've done a little bit of the background work on this, but we've, we've got a way to go. So we're also interested in having this idea of a sustainable, um, a self-contained biofactory where you can imagine a bacterial cell or some type of a cell and all you need to do is supply your substrate. It supplies the, the enzymes, the cofactors, the coenzymes, and potentially even some of the substrates. So our ideal scenario is that we have a cascade of enzymes, maybe the um, a transaminase ADH and perhaps an IRED in there, 
Um, we have a cell that produces our amine donor for our transaminase reaction. It produces the NADH, it produces the PLP and everything else we need. And all we need to do is put in a sugar and it spits out a nice amino sugar at the other side. And uh, again, Stilios is gone now, uh, um, well over a year. He was in my group when I was at the University of Nottingham um, and he's moved to a company in London now. But Stilios is a great student and he worked um, during his few years with me in Nottingham um, in, in my group predominantly, but he also um, visited the group of Professor Volker Vendic, um, who is an expert in um, G, um, sorry, in C glutamicum. And uh, again, this is a real workhorse organism. Um, it's been used for many things, but it, it can produce for the industrial production of, of, um, of uh, platform chemicals in a lot of cases. And here's the ones that we were interested in where um, the organism produces high quantities of cadaverin and putrescin. And these are definitely not updated uh, figures. I think it can produce a lot more of these. Um, but if you remember back, I mentioned this idea of smart amine donors, where we were interested in taking things like cadaverin and using those smart amine donors, which cyclize to, to pull the reaction equilibrium. So Stilios was um, involved in, in cloning some transaminases into the, um, to this particular organism. And of course, we made our life as easy as possible after we realized that things weren't as easy as they should have been. And we took a model reaction where the thermodynamics were really in our favor. So we cloned in our transaminase, I won't go into the details. Um, and we took this model reaction where we have a dicarbonyl. The transaminase is expressed in the cells. The diamine donor is produced by the cells. The PLP is produced by the cells. And we produce enough of the diamine donor that we can feed in our dicarbonyl and out the other end comes our um, disubstituted um, imine in, in really good conversion and, and good EE, and we can isolate lots of this. And we published that work last year, but we're, we're very keen to develop these types of um, self-sufficient biofactories a little bit more. Okay, so to summarize, um, I hope I've showed you that we're uh, maybe have this something in this idea of amine borrowing via shuttle biocatalysis where you're generating these reactive intermediates in situ and you've got a downstream event to pull the equilibrium and to return that amine to the original molecule by some sort of a condensation or cyclization event and that we can access some useful molecules in doing this. We're heading now towards more um, complex examples. I've got a student starting on this next year who I hope will be interested in looking at more complex examples of this, maybe cascade. Um, different enzymes, different chemistry and cascade process. And maybe as an example where you have many potential sites on the acceptor molecule uh, where your molecule, sorry, where your um, functionality can be shuttled to, but that that's shuttled selectively to one, for example. And um, so we're, we're exploring many different avenues there. And if anybody has any thoughts or ideas, we'd love to hear them. And then um, I hope I've showed you as well that we're interested in some more, maybe more practical um, cascades where we're looking at the synthesis of things like amino sugars and putting those all into a whole cell system. Okay, so it remains now for me to just thank my group who do all of the work. Um, I do very little. Um, and the, these are the, the current group down here. And these are some of the guys that worked, have recently left the group and worked at the University of Nottingham. I'd like to thank my collaborators in Manchester Metropolitan University and also my German collaborator. Um, I will say that I am recruiting, which I mentioned, a postdoc. So if any out there would like to move to sunny Dublin to join us for some enzyme engineering, we'd be delight delighted to hear from you. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks again to the organisers for letting me talk about some of our work. Thank you very much for a really interesting talk. Um, I am not a biocatalysis person, but I think I just about to follow along which is always the sign of a really good talk um if anyone has any questions please type them in the q a and i will read them out and we have the first one from john blacker who's asking um oh he's asking a two-part question uh the the quinoline generated by the picked up spengler was racemic why would that be yeah, so um, if you're using something like a, a Pictet Spenglerase, which I know Helen Hales and many other groups use, of course, you're going to set that stereo center. Um, but we're, all we're doing there, John, is we're, we're doing the shuttling of the amine functionality to generate those reactive species. Um, but we're, the selectivity isn't coming from the enzyme. The subsequent reaction is just a 
chemical transformation. And so we're unlikely to be getting much, if any, selectivity in there, unless it's taking place all within the active, in the active side of the enzyme. I'm not actually sure if we've looked at if we're generating any sort of selectivity there, but it's because it's a, a chemical uh, reaction. And the second part of John's question is, is the va vanillin a byproduct reacting with the biomass? I'm not sure what you mean there. So the vanillin sort of ty type A mean that I mentioned at some point. Yeah. Um, is, is, sure. is that reacting with the biomass is what he's asking. Um, Oops, I'm still not have done there. We might have to get the get talk about that, John, yeah, after this because I'm not sure what you're you're asking there. I've just unmuted John. If you want to ask your question, John, and then um, rather than me to translate. All right. Thanks, Josie. Um, I can't remember exactly the reaction scheme, but you showed um, the reactive aldehyde and aryl aldehyde. It's yep. a hydroxymethoxy benzaldehyde yep. um, being formed in the reaction. You were suffering really low conversions. Oh, that's right. And I wondered if um, the problem with it is that the benzaldehyde is reacting with the biomass, you know, lysines on the surface and that kind of thing. Yes, yeah, so we're not using biomass, but it certainly could be that we're getting some sort of a, a, a reaction in there. Yeah, that's 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 not helping our conversion. So, yeah, we haven't really looked. Or we've looked at that a lot, to be honest, but we we haven't got to the bottom of it. But yeah, it's, it's a good suggestion. Okay, thanks. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so Antoine Bouchard asks, um, oh, well, firstly, he thanks you for a, a fascinating talk and then um, asks, does the chirality of the sugars influence reaction? He noticed in one of your examples, which uses uh, D-arabinose, while L-arabinose is more abundant. Yeah, so we, we checked with both. Um, and I, I guess, sorry, you're talking about with the, the transaminases or the um, with the oxidation. I, I'm not sure there. So um, I guess with the with the oxidation you're talking about, because you're referring to the sugars. Um, so we, we haven't found that the we haven't found any pattern with the transaminases, for example, and we haven't found any uh, pattern with the select the stereochemistry and what sort of conversions and things like that we get. But we, we basically for that, for the transaminase work, we just tried any sugar that we could get our hands on, whether the D and the L were available, we tried them both. But we haven't seen any particular pattern with the stereochemistry. Okay, thank you. Um, and Andrew Carnell asks, for the amine donor reactions with the stoichiometric amounts of amine donor, presumably the equilibrium of the TA reaction is important and the stability of the resulting ketone, e.g. anone, is as well as the downstream reaction, e.g. cyclization. I'm not sure where the... I'm just reading this again, so I get it. Um... Yeah. I... <laughs> Andrew, are you talking about for the, for the amine shuttling? Can you be specific? For the amine borrowing reactions. So, um, Andrew, do you want to just ask your more question live? Um, I've unmuted you. I'm sure your question's very clear. It's possibly my brain. That's, that's not yeah, clear. no, sorry, it's probably not that clear. Uh, yeah, sorry, I meant for, for the for the um, amine borrowing. Um, you you talked about the downstream reaction, like a cyclization, yeah. being important to pull the equilibrium. Sure. I was just thinking about. So one of the first examples you showed us was where the uh, you were you were shuffling the amine, um, and the product of, of the the first amine donation, uh, or the product of an amine donation was an enone. So I guess then that's a more stable ketone. So that helps drive that T transaminase reaction, as well as perhaps the downstream cyclization. Yeah. It, it's that's possible that's possibly true yeah it may very well help drive i think i know what you're, you're referring to now um yeah and in some of those reactions we're a bit confused about why even the the downstream so for the for the tetrahydroisoquidylines why that process is not driving it because you think it would be pulling the equilibrium and um, so we're, we're not really sure what's going on there yeah it's pretty it's, i guess it's you know that you still need a decent equilibrium concentration of the the, the the shuttle product from that ta reaction 
especially yeah. when you're using low you know stoichiometric amounts of the starting material yeah it's true we have tried to up it a little bit it doesn't seem to improve it that much you know we've tried to up the equivalence but I, I guess thermodynamics is important as you say to some extent but we thought we'd be getting enough conversion that we would still pull that but amazingly we, we just can't quite get there so we're making life easier and we're going back to easier sort of substrates and aldehydes and trying to to make the thermodynamics a bit more favorable and see if that helps yeah great thanks great talk by the way thank you andrew um, so we have another question, which is asking about the monitoring of reactions. Do you use any calorimetric compounds to monitor your intermediates, or do you use a physical technique at the end of the reaction to estimate final product? Okay, yeah, no, thanks for that question. Um, we actually just use water suppression NMR in most of ours. So, um, you know, I spent a lot of my postdoc and maybe uh, my students have spent a lot of time working up reactions and isolating them and putting them on. But actually, there's a lot of problems with that. It's time consuming. It doesn't always give you an overall picture. So what we tend to do now, which works well, sometimes it's a bit tough to read them, but we just put on the reaction, spin it down and, and stick on a water suppression protein NMR and try and monitor the reactions. So my, if any of my students are in the audience now, they'll tell you that sounds easy, but they're, they're all struggling to, to read the spectra, but it probably is the easiest way. And of course, sometimes we use HPLC and GC as well, but no, we don't use, for these ones that I've showed you, we don't really use any colorimetric techniques, except for, sorry, except for the transaminase chemistry where we're looking at sugars. Uh, we do use a little bit for that. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions for Elaine? Um, nothing's coming on the chat that's not been in the Q and A, as far as I can see. Just give people a moment to type. Um, is there a, a link for your postdoc advert, Elaine? Not yet, because. Um trying to get something advertised is an incredibly long process i think it might be complicated as well but it'll be there soon and now i will send it around on the usual link soon but i'd love to recruit quickly because i know my, my students would love a molecular biologist of some type in, in the lab soon or somebody who's good at enzyme engineering and so watch this space on that um, so I hope you'll all join me in virtually thanking Elaine for a really excellent talk. Thank you for, for giving us your time to share your research with us. It's been fascinating. Um, thanks for it. Thanks for having me. And um, just a quick advert, our next webinar is on the 9th of June um, with uh, Jude and Arwaldi from Aston talking about um, uh, chemical recycling of different uh, waste product plastics in hydrothermal media. So if that's at the top of interest, please join us then. You can find the, the links on the Cat Hub website. Um, and we have a, a print put the um, link in the chat if you are interested in future webinars. And um, we will keep our, our program going um, for the foreseeable future. Um, and with that, I will draw this to a close and thank Elaine again. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Hopefully we can, we can have an in-person conference soon, but watch this one. Thanks, Josie. Thanks all. Bye.